Okay. Yeah. I'm going to texture. Okay, there she is. Yeah, yeah, stay muted. Okay, so we're live on YouTube, but all they see is the bumper. They don't see us or they can't hear us because we're all muted. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Nomi Key Show. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we were dealing with a different type of technical issue this time around. I, uh, I I don't know what to say. It seems like it was Zoom. Zoom was not connecting live. <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it there. We are trying so hard. Uh, we have a great team here, Dorsey and Kyle. We're we're behind the scenes trying to make this work. So thank you for your patience for sticking around. Uh, we're gonna shift the show around a little bit because we want to respect people's time. But I just want to start off with the main uh, themes of the convention last night. You know, the convention last night uh, was unusual. It was an unconventional convention. It was done over Zoom. A lot of pre-recorded interviews, a lot of pre-recorded uh, statements, and there was even a musical montage with a uh, interesting set of graphics behind as as two different generations of musical performers uh, played what was a revolutionary song of the 60s. So, you know, very curious how the thinking um, and the creativity behind the convention came together. But I do think that there's one thing that was important, uh, that was illustrated and was intentional by the Democratic establishment, by the staff of the DNC, and that was they made a choice. They made a choice to lean in and try to win over probably what seems to be upper middle class uh, white Republicans they invited upper middle class wealthy white Republicans to the stage, whether it was John Kasich or uh, Christine Todd Whitman uh, or former Congresswoman Mal Malinari. These were what you would call like the anti-Trump Republicans. And I think the big question is why do that when we could be leaning in to working people, uh, to the issues that they're facing right now with multiple crises facing us, whether it's a healthcare crisis, a student loan crisis, a housing crisis. Uh, of course, Black Lives Matter activists have been organizing on the streets for about a decade now. Uh, these, these are the issues that I think a lot of people on the progressive side, especially those under 40, think are, 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 are what the Democratic Party needs to lean in in talking about and uh, identifying and discussing and coming up with solutions and highlighting in their platform 
Uh, climate, of course, is also a huge issue. But no, no, no. We had several Republicans on stage. So I think the question is why. And I, I just don't buy it. I don't think this is a winning strategy. Uh, just some, some basic numbers that I think, you know, we're 77 days away from the election. So keep this in mind. We're 77 days away from the election. And in many states, there's early voting that is starting pretty much in a month, a little over a month. Now, the decision to, to, to move towards upper middle class uh, Republicans is is a numbers game in which I, I think the numbers are just too tight. Um, you know, I, I think that they're depending and and feeling like they're going to have the working class base when if you look at the Hillary Clinton election 2016, you know, she without opening an office up in, in Wisconsin with leaning into the same voters, it didn't work. In 2012, Obama carried 40% of the electorate making under $50,000 a year by a landslide. Those are landslide margins against Romney. Families between 30 and 50 carried Obama to a victory. Obama lost everyone over making over $100,000 a year. 38% of the electorate. And what the Democrats now are trying to do is lean into winning those people over. And Clinton won under 50,000, uh, those who made under $50,000 a year, but by much smaller margins, not the numbers that they needed. So is it that the Democrats are taking working people for granted and they want to, to lean into recruiting these these defected Trump voters uh, to the win? Or is it that they, they really don't care about working people? My guess is Democrats think that working people those who identify with progressive values, they think that these folks are going to turn out no matter what because of the conditions that Trump has created, uh, that he has exacerbated, and that they need the icing on the cake is the Republicans. And that was their form of unity last night. Having Bernie Sanders on stage who talks about how he you know, works with Republicans in the Senate, and then having John Kasich on stage. stage. Having Michael Bloomberg on later on in the week. Uh, these are interesting tactics and strategies and i think it's a huge bet i think all of us probably watching right now think that if the democrats became the workers party and had folks like ken dimenstein from uh, the postal workers union on talking or sarah nelson who arguably ended the government shutdown as the flight attendants workers president you know these are the folks that we want to see the democrats put forward so uh i uh uh I think there's some, some, some big questions uh, to ask moving forward, and, um, and we're going to be covering them all week. But I'm very excited because we have the one and only John Nichols on as our first guest. He's been patient. Everybody's been so patient with the Zoom crisis that we face today. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the CEO of Zoom? Man, they have so much power. Um, John Nichols, he is the author of the new book with my little bookmark in place, uh, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party talks about a really important convention and a uh, time period when a progressive leader lost uh, their power. So, John, thank you so much for joining us and for your patience. Uh, first question is, who was Henry Wallace? Yeah, I hope you can hear me. I Are can hear we you. Yeah, you're linked good. up? You're good. You're good. You're good to go. Fantastic. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a little tenuous now, and I, I think you're experiencing a little of what I thought I would see last night at the convention. Um, with, uh, you know, I was fearful that you'd have all these speakers at the convention not linking up and, and right. struggling. So, glad to be with you, and glad to talk about Henry Wallace. Thank you so much. So, so okay, so th that was a convention that uh, it was all out in the open. And, and I say that because we now have primaries, which lead up to the convention, which is, you know, today now very theatrical. There are some sort of committees that can be, you know, from the platform committee, you can watch it, sure, but it's not even in the convention itself. But Henry Wallace uh, lost his vice presidential spot under FDR. Mm -hmm. why, why? What was the lead up to that? It's an incredible story, and it's why I wrote a book about it. Um, in, <laughs> in 1940. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt decided to steer left. Uh, he got rid of his Southern, more conservative, very conservative vice president, John Nance Garner, and replaced him with Henry Wallace, who was really the dynamic progressive member of his administration during the first two terms as Secretary of Agriculture. Wallace uh, 
kind of like leapt into the vice presidency and became a huge hero for people on the left, uh, particularly labor unions and uh, African-Americans, Latinos and others who were organizing. Uh, and there's, of course, a great history of organizing on civil rights issues in the late 30s and early 1940s that is often lost on our on our national discussions. But it was there and Wallace embraced it. In 1943, there were race riots in a number of cities. In Detroit, there was an incident where uh, dozens of African-Americans were killed, many of them by police officers. Wallace chose to fly to Detroit. Imagine this, the sitting vice president of the United States flew to Detroit and addressed a crowd of thousands of trade unionists, an integrated crowd, and said, those who are practicing racism at home, those who are dividing people based on their race and their ethnicity, are practicing an Americanized fascism. Hmm. He linked the struggle against uh, totalitarianism in Europe, which was something everybody was highly engaged with, with um, racism at home. It was an incredibly controversial thing. When he did it, the New York Times called him out, uh, many of the political leaders, and remember the Democratic Wait, Party. Why did they call him out, though? Oh. That seems logical. What are you talk- Fascism is rising. Similar tactics yeah. at home. Yeah. Uh, internationalism. I mean, I, I, I can't quite understand. No. There are two reasons why they called him out. One was that we were in the midst of, a, of an epic war, and there were people who said that you were dividing the war effort. Now, one of the things that, that again, history doesn't tell us as much as we should know about this um, is that, in fact, we were a very divided country at that time. Mm-hmm. There were real differences. And Wallace wasn't dividing the country. He was, in fact, saying, here, this is the root of the problem. He was going to the systemic issues that needed to be addressed. And um, and he had allies, people like A. Philip Randolph and, and other civil rights activists who were stepping up and saying, this has to be a double V campaign, double victory, victory against fascism in Europe, victory against racism here at home. And uh, that earned him criticism for the New York Times, mainly for, quote unquote, dividing the war effort. It earned him the rage of the Southern segregationists who remained a huge block within the Democratic Party. It's important to understand this, that Mm -hmm. the so-called solid South was very real. And so as you came to the 1944 convention, Wallace faced a real test. Roosevelt, very involved with the war, essentially signaled that the convention would be open, that it would be the delegates could choose who they wanted for vice president. Um, He sent a letter saying that if he was a delegate, he would vote for Wallace. But he didn't do anything more than that. He actually sent some signals about other figures. So it was left to Wallace to defend himself. He went to the convention, and instead of doing what politicians usually do, which is, you know, kind of soften things and try and, you know, pat people on the back and rebuild, you know, whatever alliances you might, Wallace went to the convention, stepped right up on the stage, and uh, in his seconding speech for uh, Franklin Roosevelt. They allowed him to give a second speech. The bosses of the convention didn't want him on stage, but they let him do this, uh, which, by the way, is the same role that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez will have tonight as a seconder for Bernie Sanders. Um, in this speech that was sort of that the bosses tried to marginalize, um, Wallace got up and said, the future of the Democratic Party is to go straight down the line with progressivism, with liberal values as regards race, and gender and a host of other issues. He called out the poll tax. He called out segregation. He demanded that the party rise up and be a party of economic and social and racial justice. The amazing thing was that instead of being rejected, the convention erupted in in applause and cheering. And when Roosevelt was renominated, there was an effort to renominate Wallace. Claude Pepper, the senator from Florida, who was a big Wallace backer, tried to force his way to stage to call for renomination by acclamation, um, he got within a few feet and they gaveled the convention out of order. They shut it down. How how were they able to do that? What tricks do they have up their sleeves? They just did it? A, a big gavel and a, <laughs> a chairman of the convention who literally said, um, I hear a call for a recess, a call for you know closing down for the night. The, the hall booed incredibly loudly it said the whole the building shook with opposition to it wow and the chairman said i hear a majority in favor of shutting down gavel the convention closed they shut down the lights they turned off the music they forced everybody out and the next day 
when the vote for vice president was then rescheduled for was going to be held. Um, when people showed up, they found their tickets had been changed. They couldn't get in. What? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. If you read, it's just an amazing story uh, told by, you know, and I went back and read the diaries, read all the, yeah. the details. Um, and then, you know, also there was all the things that you could imagine in a boss driven party where you didn't have a lot of internal democracy. Uh, there were offers of jobs and and pressures and bribes, not bribes necessarily money so much as political power. And at the end of the day, even then, Wallace won the first ballot. But hmm. everybody started shifting and moving lots more you know, negotiations. And they finally beat him. He was pushed to the pushed out instead of, hmm. you know, walking away in anger. Wallace said, we're fighting against fascism. It's a vital struggle. I can't, you know, I, I didn't win this. I'm, I'm still ready, signing up, ready for duty. He went out on the campaign trail at his own expense, campaigned for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Harry Truman, the guy who beat him, he appeared with Truman and walked him to the microphone at rallies because Wallace was so much more popular. Roosevelt was so impressed that he brought Wallace back into the administration, gave him a new cabinet post. They were working very closely on a massive jobs plan, a massive housing plan an economic bill of rights mm. when Roosevelt died. And after Roosevelt's death, Wallace was forced out, marginalized. Um, he tried a third party run in 1948 that, Against that did, not, did not succeed and um, was written out of our history. And what I set out to do for two purposes was to write him back into our history. One, because I think we need to know about this remarkable man who, who mm -hmm. waged this incredible struggle 80 years ago for economic and social and racial justice. And two, because as I write about in much of the book, which is both the story of Wallace and a history of the last 75 to 80 years, uh, this happens again and again and again in the Democratic Party. Right. It has. OK, so it's happened again and again and again. What is the, the next notable moment where this has happened? Well, there's so many of them. Uh, the best example is kind of a tragic one, is that after Wallace ran in 48, it's notable that two groups went out of the Democratic Party in 48. One group went to the left. Wallace and, and many of his followers, uh, mm -hmm. including a young, uh, another group went to the right. And these were the segregationists following Strom Thurmond. In 1952, at the Democratic Convention, the segregationists were all let back in, whereas the progressives were not. And they nominated a segregationist for vice president in 1952, who had been a part of the segregationist exit from the party in 48 and had worked to keep Truman off the ballot. And so like today, in well, it's way. I would argue even a little more uh, horrific. Um, but then I, I think you'd be right about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I tell this no one's story calling though. Kay such a, a segregationist, at least. No, I mean, he's just a bad he's a bad messenger. Um, but what I will tell you is that again and again, you saw progressives rise to to make the struggle for the soul of the Democratic Party incredible people along the way. And I write about these struggles, moments where they succeeded. And it's important to remember there have been successes. Um, Linda Johnson pulled well to the left of where he had been uh, and actually accepting civil rights, voting rights, a war on poverty, uh, so many initiatives in, in the 60s. The rise of the 60s movements, which led into George McGovern's nomination mm -hmm. in 1972. And the hidden story of, of what happened with McGovern, not told uh, that after he was nominated, after a grassroots campaign literally won the nomination of the party, leading figures in the party, cab former cabinet members, current cabinet members, mayors, governors, uh, members of Congress formed Democrats for Nixon and actively campaigned against their own party's nominee uh, and Whoa. bought full page ads in the papers, ran a whole campaign against their own party's nominee. Now, McGovern might not have won in 72, but he would have done a lot better if the party hadn't literally campaigned, if huge parts of the party leadership had literally campaigned against him. And it's interesting yeah. though, because that's what, um, when you talk to some of these old timer establishment members of the DNC, the, the uh, Elaine K. Mark is a perfect example. If, for those of you who don't know Elaine K. Mark, um, she, she was on the Unity Reform Commission with me. Uh, I believe she was either present for the Hunt Commission or there at the Hunt Commission as a member. Maybe. In, in 80, exactly, or 80, 81, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, 
And that was where they established superdelegates. And one line that she says, and I hear it repeated over and over, is we just don't want another McGovern, meaning the map was horrible yeah. when McGovern lost. And I remember arguing at the Unity Reform Commission, I think 2016 was essentially our McGovern year. Like, we were supposed to win. We, we, we lost the popular, we won the popular vote, lost the map. I mean, maybe it's not the same exact map, but their fear or the, the messaging that they've been using as a fear mechanism for the last 40 years has been, we don't want another McGovern. We can't have, no, you know. You hear it again and again. And they compared Bernie Sanders to McGovern. Exactly. Um, but here's the interesting thing about it. Um, I would, it, in defense of people who use that, mm -hmm. I have heard that argument even made by progressives by people who have just, you know, taken it on. They assume McGovern lost horribly um, because he was, you know, too progressive, too left wing. Uh, the reality is that McGovern got about 40 percent of the vote and um, came quite close in a number of states. And if you had had, you know, anything like a united Democratic Party, I think he would have done dramatically better. Right. But there was a choice. There was a choice by a lot of leading figures to make this this exit from the party to back the Republican president of the United States, Richard Nixon. And and we need to understand that, that, that often when it's said that progressives have lost or it's said that they've failed, they didn't necessarily fail because their ideas didn't work with a lot of people. They, they failed because they were undermined. Another, to my mind, a, a, a classic example um, was in 1988, and I write about it a lot in the book, in 1988, Jesse Jackson went to the Democratic National Convention with an incredible coalition of backers. He had built something that was so dynamic. R.W. Apple, the New York Times writer, said that 1988 was the year of Jesse Jackson, that, that what he did was, was you know, transformative in our politics. Now, at the convention, uh, he was afforded a speaking slot, and he gave a, one of the epic speeches in American political history, uh, which people should all, if you want to hear a good convention speech check it out the 88 convention speech yeah yes. yeah it's just Beautiful. incredible but here's here's the interesting thing instead of picking jackson for vice president right the the runner-up for the nomination a guy who was young and you know exciting and it built a real movement had Rainbow a great Malishan. vision exactly instead of picking him they picked lloyd benson <laughs> <laughs> the conservative <laughs> southern business senator from texas because somehow that would win them the south right well, they didn't win Texas. They didn't win Southern states, but they lost a whole bunch of states with substantial populations of African-Americans and young people who Jackson had proposed to mobilize. Yeah. And so what I do in the book is I go through the actual data on the populations, how close these elections were. And I argue confidently that if they had put Jesse Jackson on the ticket again, maybe they wouldn't have won in 88. But they would have had a much stronger result and it would have begun to build the party That's right. toward a future. And, um, and I just tell you that we see again and again, not just at the presidential level, uh, but folks like Ron Dellums and Bella Abza and, and others, uh, a young Paul Wellstone, a young Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. who you know, struggled with uh, party leadership that, that didn't, often didn't welcome them but tried to, you know, push him to this uh, edge, either say you change or, you know, this isn't just this just isn't going to work for you. And there are heroes all along the way. Um, and the one lesson I would I would offer is I know sometimes people will hear this story and they'll say, well, then why bother? Right. Why keep fighting for the soul of the Democratic Party? Well, there, there's two answers to that. Number one, this country, I, I would love it if this country had multi-party democracy, but this country has all kinds of structural barriers to third parties and to independent runs and alternative politics. They are rigid and the media backs them up at every turn. Right. And so uh, fighting for the soul of the Democratic Party is a is not necessarily the only fight, but it is a legitimate fight. Right. And instead of giving up on it, I think one of the things that progressives need to understand is that they are in a permanent struggle right. and that that struggle requires them to organize permanently to recognize that, you know, it's not just around a person, it's it's around a long term vision of economic and social and racial justice, saving the planet, dialing down militarism. And if they organize around that and, and keep moving forward, as frankly, conservatives did in the Republican Party, that moment can come. And in fact, the times rather than individuals often form the moment. And it just strikes me that right now we are in a moment in this country 
where uh, progressives should be pushing harder than ever. It's not a time so, to back off. It's a time to push hard. So that's interesting because, you know, Bernie Sanders has been Bernie Sanders for his entire career, his entire lifetime. Mm-hmm. You find, obviously, uh, we've all seen them. Speeches he gave, you know, uh, in the early 80s when he was uh, running for mayor, not even in yeah. the – he ran multiple times. And, and, and the moment, 2016 – uh, was right for the message of Bernie Sanders so much so that so much of his his uh, his supporters they're all you know very young, um, not all of them but the, a big ch- a lot all, basically all young people are supporters of Bernie Sanders in other words, so um, you know with that being said like this this is this moment I. I I, there's a reason why I wanted to have you on and, and kind of learn from history because when you say things the fight has to continue, mm-hmm. um, as someone who's like personally been involved in some of the rule uh, trying to do the rule changes and that's the next part of the show we talk about that but it's hard when the chessboard is controlled by people who basically control the game it's not just that they control the pieces they control the game and they change the rules of the game when it looks like things aren't working out in their favor whether it's uh gaveling uh yeah. you know in the, in the old days or today it's um suddenly realizing that the 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 voter counter in the DNC chairs race stopped working, and so suddenly we have to move to the second ballot. Uh, yeah, I mean these are the tricks of the of 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 the system, and they'll always find there will always be a trick. There will mm-hmm. always be a way for them to gather around their their chosen candidate or push out their progressives. So, you know, if we stay in the fight uh, and we change these rules incrementally. I, I understand that perspective. I've been involved in that perspective, but climate change is in our face. Oh yeah. And so, I mean, in this moment, like, what hope can you give? I mean, how quickly can change happen when, even if Joe Biden does win, which I, I personally hope Donald Trump is pushed out of office, mm-hmm. Joe Biden is going to control the DNC now. And my guess is they're not going to let any progressives in that DNC the way that they kind of pushed him out over the last few years. Well, look, here's what I'll tell you. Um, I can give you every argument in the world for giving up. It's, it's not that hard. To, to you know and and but I don't believe in it i I genuinely believe from from reading history that there are people who have faced uh incredible barriers and and uh barriers that that today I think we can't even imagine and, you know for the first sixty years of the country roughly uh the issue of slavery human bondage was not allowed to be debated in Congress okay. so you couldn't even bring it up right and if you did you, you were sanctioned for that and uh eventually. At a certain point, people, some people who had fought their whole lives um, forged a new party. They forged a Republican Party, and they transformed our politics at that time. That's the last time that a, a major party an effort has succeeded in forming one. Um, but I will tell you, on the sad side, to my mind, conservatives took that party over, right? Mm-hmm. And they, if you read the, the stories of conservatives from the 50s and the 60s, uh, how frustrated they were with the Republican Party establishment and how all the barriers they thought that they faced. And in fact, that they did, um, they kept at it because mm-hmm. they believed in certain things. I don't happen to share their beliefs. Um, but what I will tell you is that if we believe in economic and social and racial justice, it's our job to find the best vehicles that we can. I'm not here to tell people not to try what they think will work. I, I respect that. And I write about it movements and and efforts to try different approaches. But what I am here to tell you is that there's a lot of history that says that that when you organize hard and you get knocked down and it's deeply frustrating, if you still keep organizing and if you're there when the moment comes, unimaginable things become possible very rapidly because you built the the basics, you built things in. It is simply true that people were organizing on labor rights for decades centuries before the New Deal came. And yet when that moment came, suddenly you opened the doors and had radical change. And we, we had a labor movement and it was huge and it was meaningful and it transformed lives. Similarly, with the civil rights movement, the roots of the civil rights movement, you know, run so deep and, and people were working so hard. I, I, I always hold up A. Philip Randolph. He's a hero in my book. He's a hero, you know, in so many ways. April Randolph started organizing in 1917, hmm. and um, and he was there in 1963 at the March on Washington. He was the chairman of the march, Amazing. and and in the article the next day uh, from the March on Washington, 
when Randolph appeared at a socialist party organized event, because Randolph was a socialist, um, he, his message was, we have more marching to do. Hmm. So they had just had the march on Washington. They'd literally gotten to the White House. And he said, well, back to work, people. And um, what he was marching for was, was uh, to make the promise of racial justice linked to the promise of economic yeah, justice. justice yeah. So there you go. I mean, it's and an if okay, he, yeah. and I'm just going to say, if A. Philip Randolph, you know, after all those years, if he was ready to keep marching, I, I suppose we should too. Yeah. So, okay. I am all for continuing to march, especially with these electoral wins. Um, mm-hmm. I do want to go back to the third party thing because I think this yeah. is a good opportunity for us to talk to progressives who may feel defeated right now and think the third party is the way. And an argument I always make is, well, the mechanics, is, it's just fundamentally very difficult based on how uh, based on how our political systems are structured in this country. So can you explain a little bit more about like w- what is it that stands in the way of forming uh, a national third party? No. Again, I, you, asked, you, you threw the, the, the operative word in there when you said national, right? The fact of the matter is that third party efforts have worked in places around the country. We have city-based third parties. We have some state-based third parties like the Vermont Progressive Party uh, that have been significantly influential and, and had an impact. We have the Green Party that has success and, and power in some places and it has had, had breakthroughs over the last many years. And, um, and on the other the, the more conservative side, you see libertarians uh, having some success, but usually at the local level. The challenge at the national level is that uh, it is usually organized in a moment. And that's not something you can do in a moment. Uh, it is something you should do rapidly. Uh, you can't you know, keep organizing for 50 years and think somehow that, that that becomes a question of whether you're gonna organize a third party over that amount of time. But what does happen is that you, you work through several cycles. And the reason you have to do that, rather than just say, oh, uh, I'm upset, well, let's go form a party, um, is because power develops structures that prevent parties, new parties from rising. Uh, there is simply no question that, that one of the biggest uh, you know, fixes in our politics is the, the way that states give ballot lines, permanent ballot lines to the two major parties, but make new parties petition on and have to literally fight to, to get their place. Now, there's also you know, all the other struggles of raising money and stuff like that. Where this becomes a challenge then is that you're told, okay, you have to do all this work just to get on the ballot, right? You get to, all of your energy has to go to getting on the ballot rather than fighting the issue debate of the moment, right? right? right. And effectively what power does is turn third-party organizing into a, they, they require you to create a machine, right? And to always be tinkering with that machine and to try and, you know, keep on the ballot, you know, keep, keep in the game. It takes so much energy and, and so much, you know, focus that it, I think it undermines third parties in many, many senses. And I, interesting thing is that I wrote a book, A History of Socialism in the United States, a number of years ago. And, and I spent a lot of time when I was doing the research for it, talking to very, very, very old people about when socialists actually won big elections, mayoralties, congressional seats, uh, you know, state uh, legislative seats, where cases, I think most people don't know that there was a time when the socialists were the number two party in many states. Republicans might be the majority, but the second largest caucus was the socialists in a state like Wisconsin, where I come from. Milwaukee, where the Democrats are supposed to be meeting at this point, uh, is a city that had socialist mayors for 50 years. Socialist sheriffs, socialist city councils, socialist school boards. Wow. They won elections and, and they did it over time with a lot of structural organizing and a lot of structural work. But I will tell you that the, the old timers told me always that one of the things they always had to be on the watch because every time they took their eye off it, somebody in a legislature would pass a law to make it harder to, to maintain, you know, whatever you were doing, made it harder to, to practice politics. And so what you have to understand is this, it, it isn't that to talk down third parties, it's to talk them up, right? Mm-hmm. It's not to talk down mm-hmm. multi-party democracy, it's to talk it up, which I think it's a very, it's, it's something that I think really is vital and it works in a lot of countries. But it is to say that what you have to understand is just as there's a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, there is a fight uh, to engage in multi-party democracy. And it's a permanent fight. Power will always 
you know, get in there and try and make it harder. We'll try to erect barriers. And this, in it's many cases, the same people that would erect barriers in a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, if you go third party, they're like, well, got to move over there. And, oh, absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And so then the question becomes, where do you where do you start to where do you do, do your work? I mean, and again, I'm not telling people what to do. I think people have to make their own choices. And I really respect that. Uh, but I will say that that it's been very interesting to watch uh, Democratic Socialists of America choose to make their fight inside the Democratic Party in primaries, taking on uh, powerful incumbents. It's been intriguing to watch Justice Democrats and other groups do that. And um, you obviously followed very closely the, the fight of Cori Bush. Um, and she ran two runs as uh, it wasn't easy. It was very, very frustrating, very, very challenging. Uh, but she got, you know, she's going to Congress, right? And there's a lot of people who are going to Congress uh, out of this cycle. The interesting thing is this cycle will see more breakthroughs for the left within the Democratic Party than 2018, which was seen as kind of a transformative moment. Our media doesn't cover it that way, right? They, our media will always find a way to say, oh, you were last year's story, right? Right. Uh, but in fact, we're part of a multi-year story right now that is a fascinating one. And these primary challenges are working. And also, I would say that there is a transformation of elected criminal justice posts in this country, district attorneys, prosecutor jobs, in some cases, state attorneys general, mm -hmm. um, judges. Oh, there's something happening out there. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, you know, simply focusing on frustrations at the national level, which I do understand, and it's a week of, of doing that, uh, <laughs> Instead of simply focusing on frustrations at the national level, I would always encourage people to keep an eye on what's happening at the grassroots around the country because there's an awful lot of evidence that uh, the battlers for necessary change are prevailing in a lot of places. And one final thing I'll say about that, I always use the word necessary change. Mm -hmm. Often when we organize, when we think about going forward, you know, we talk about our, our ideals and our goals and what we want. Um, I think progressives win when they're talking about what is absolutely necessary, right. when there is no alternative. And right now, there is no alternative that works to Medicare for all. Right. There is no alternative to a Green New Deal. There is no alternative to fundamental criminal justice reform. These are the things that, that need to happen. And um, so there's a duty, if those are the things that need to happen, to find the absolute best routes to do it. And again, I'm not going to tell people what route to take. But I will tell people the route you decide to take, stick to it and work hard on it over time, as I know so many people do, because um, I do think we're in a moment with the coronavirus pandemic, with mass unemployment, with uh, this rising cry for racial justice, where big things are possible and we don't want to miss this moment. Because we are missing. You know, moment no, sure. I don't think we are, but also we can't afford to. So there's nothing next if we don't. There's, we there's don't absolutely. Right. I mean, climate change is in our face. The healthcare crisis of you know hundreds of thousands of people uh, in this country uh, have been hit by COVID and and unfortunately have perished because of a lack of of responsiveness uh, from both mm -hmm. our our president and Democratic governors um, and mayors mm -hmm. in New York specifically. <laughs> um, so moving forward, though, I, I think the the ultimate question, kind of looking back at history. Whether it's, let's just, I'm asking everybody this question. Joe sure. Biden becomes president. Uh, he takes over the DNC. Uh, he puts together a team of our favorite class of young neoliberals. Uh, the cabinet, you know, a lot of people feel motivated to run for higher office. We'll have his support, whether it's Pete Buttigieg or Hakeem Jeffries. Um, how do we pressure Joe Biden? And, and, and despite the fact that, he does have the power. How does the movement continue to pressure and win and in a way that is different than with the Democrats not in power under Trump? Two answers. Number one, um, uh, learn our history. Recognize that Franklin Roosevelt uh, wasn't all that great at the start. Uh, there were a lot of people who were highly critical of Franklin Roosevelt, who were deeply frustrated with him, including a number of people within the Democratic Party and people uh, beyond the Democratic Party who were involved in farmer labor, progressive American Labor Party activism in the 1930s into the 1940s. Um, and he got better because people pressured him to get better. Um, and he acknowledged it. He actually 
reportedly, would say to activists, go out and make me better. You know, go out and make me do it. And um, and I interviewed Bernie Sanders the other day, and it was very interesting because Sanders, I asked him about that. And Sanders said that in his conversations with Biden, he had a sense that Biden, uh, he, he hoped, and I'm not, I don't want to put words in his mouth per se, you can read the interview in the nation, but um, that that Biden would be that sort of president, not necessarily because of his past, but because of his present, because of the moment we are in, that you need you need a, a united party and you need something beyond it. You need something connected to movements that is about big, bold structural change. So that's number one answer. The, and, and it is that um, that the moment may make it easier and the movements may make it easier. The number two answer, which I think is just as important, uh, but but comes from a come a slightly different direction, is that I think power is more scared of the left right now um, than it used to be. I, I've come in politics for a really long time, and uh, I really I remember uh, new Ron Dellums interviewed him. I remember when Ron Dellums was was feeling pretty lonely, uh, and when uh, uh, oh. Uh, I try to think of, you know, a young Paul Wellstone, you know, really, you know, kind of banging against a lot of walls, a young Russ Feingold, um, Bella Abzug and people like that who, who, you know, got knocked down a lot of times politically. And um, the, the interesting thing about it is that there are moments when the right or the center, neoliberals, whatever we want to call folks, when they're the corporate folks, when they're very confident that they can roll over everything, they have their moments. Um, and then there are moments where they're not so confident, where they actually don't know if they have the answers. They know what their donors want them to do, but they're not sure if they have the answers. And in those moments, real possibilities open up. Noam Chomsky always says that the great progress is made when power divides, right? When, when power itself isn't quite sure because of the challenges of the moment what to do. And that's a moment, that's a place where the left steps in and says, hey, we've got, you know, we have a route here that actually is super popular and has tremendous potential. Um, I, I think we're in one of those moments. I'm sad in some ways because it's, this country is, is at a jarring place. It's at a very unsettling place. And so we, you, know, you can't really celebrate. Uh, what you do is you recognize, you recognize that the moment is here and that you have tens of millions of people who've lost their jobs and their benefits. And we shouldn't tie benefits to your job. We should have a Medicare for all program. We have a climate crisis that is real and that is overwhelming. And that, you know, we just had the, like the record temperature in the world, not, you know, some distant place in, in California, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so in a moment like that, uh, we step in. We step in with clear answers. Uh, we're t- talking in an afternoon tonight, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez will for a very brief moment, because they don't give you a lot of time, uh, uh, will address the Democratic National Convention. Uh, what she says, I will, I will venture to suggest, will uh, probably be more memorable than, memorable than a lot of the other speeches. And there may be some kid out there in Kansas or Nebraska or Michigan or Florida or wherever listening, because they, they really are interested and they really do care. And they're going to hear something there and they're going to decide that they're, they're in on this. They're in for this. And that's what, uh, you know, Harvey Milk used to say. People would ask him why he was so outrageous. You know, he was a, his first openly gay elected official. And, and he would do um, things that were, that, that were super controversial and would always make the news. And they said, why do, you, why do you do this? Why don't you just kind of like fit into the system a little more? And he said, because I think that there's some kid in Nebraska who is having a really hard time in school and having a really hard time with his family, maybe. And maybe one day he, he opens up his dad's paper and he sees a little article that there's a gay elected official in San Francisco who's fighting for justice. And he thinks, okay, maybe it's not good for me here. Maybe, I, maybe I'll move to San Francisco and maybe I'll, I'll, be, I'll do something there. But, but that there's hope. And, and part of our job is to, is to give people hope uh, to go on and fight harder and bigger. That's what Henry Wallace did. Uh, and it was a funny thing when I was writing the book, I would find very, very old people who said, uh, who would say, when I was 10 years old, my parents took me to a Henry Wallace rally and it never left me. 
That's incredible. I, we, we all have those memories. I met Paul Wellstone when I was 16 years old and two months later he passed away in a, oh. a plane crash and, and I'll never forget uh, the way that he spoke as part of this program called Junior Statesman, the way that he spoke to us versus all the other elected officials who came yeah. in and spoke and it was um, it was powerful and I, we, I think we all have those moments. John Nichols, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for doing for writing this book. Uh, the book is The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. You could not have a better title for it. Uh, you are the national correspondent for the nation. Is that correct? Got it right. And um, we hope to have you back on again soon. I, I you know, you do great work. Do, do great. Work. I don't know how you have so much time to write, to be honest, but you do great work. It's a great pleasure. And um, I, I have the wonderful opportunity to write about people who are doing great work. And so it makes it an awful lot easier. It's a good moment, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Keep it up. All right, guys, if you are not already, uh, make sure to click subscribe and like on uh, YouTube. If you're on YouTube, make sure to click subscribe and like and share. Uh, up next, we have, we're going to be talking about the rules of the Democratic Party and why they matter. Uh, we've had a few glitches, as you guys know, in the show, so we're shaking things up a little bit. Uh, we're going to bring on some of our guests on, onto other shows this week because we think we we figured out why Zoom was down Oh, the fun. Oh, the joy. Um, so stick around for two seconds. We're going to bring in our next speaker, and uh, we'll talk about the rules of the party and what that means right now in this moment. Oh my god i could watch that all day long we had to do a remix of that because it's really the macarena so <laughs> we don't we didn't want to get in trouble um so uh brent welder is a former candidate for congress in kansas he's an attorney at the welder firm uh you were a former national field director i believe for the teamsters union and and you just sat on the dnc's rules committee uh, which we'll get to in a second. But just before we get to it, I want everybody to know uh, we are re rescheduling Jane Kleb and Larry Cohen for later this week. So you want to check us out. 3 p.m. That's our normal time. 3 to 4 p.m. on YouTube.com slash The Nomi Key Show. If you're not a patron, make sure to go to Patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show. We're putting special content on there. It's what makes this show happen. We can't control Zoom operations, though. We're trying. <laughs> like, we really can't. Brent, welcome to the show. Um... You're a delegate. Uh, oh, well, I'm I'm a, a committee member, I guess. I think, I'm, I think I'm a special guest at this uh, at this convention this oh. time around. Uh, special the, guest, but you're in the uh, virtual convention. <laughs> but you're, where are you right now? <laughs> the only kind of special guest that they would ever have if Bernie Sanders was the one that invited that particular special guest. But I I am in uh, my law office in Kansas City right now, actually. Kansas um, City. I am, and uh, uh, you know. Um, had a had a fun time watching the the convention last night with my wife. Um, I you know my my first thought was I think the 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 DNC and the establishment folks were glad that it was going to be a virtual convention because they wouldn't get any booze. But I think there was plenty of booze last night. It was just happening in everybody's house, like because we had to drink beer just to be able to you know focus and get through the the two hours, especially that first hour. 
Um, I mean, there were some really nice parts, but but uh, it was really something. It, it kind of reminded me of of like the kind of PBS programming that you would have to watch when you were a kid and homesick yep. from school. Yep. Um, it was pretty. It was pretty rough. No, it was it was like an infomercial. Um, but you know, I, it wasn't just that it was an infomercial. It was that it was geared towards this republic and this this. I don't know if it's a real base that they're trying to recruit or if they're just signaling to donors, but. Um, before we get to the mechanics of why they're leaning Republican, I, I, I saw this clip. Um, Rahm Emanuel, remember him? Oh, yeah. Um, the former oh, congressman, yes. former head of the DCCC, Democratic campaign, uh, uh, Congressional Campaign Committee. <laughs> he uh, was one of the architects of this like neoliberal take on of the Democrats in Congress. Uh, he started appealing to conservative uh, conservative voters by finding conservative, you know, wealthy uh, people to run for Congress, and and then of course he 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 worked in the Obama administration as famously Jeff called Jeff. progressives the R word. Yes, among yes. other things. Yes, he um, he has a temper. He likes to uh, swear a lot, and then he became mayor of Chicago, in uh, in which you know he took on teachers and tried to turn everything into a charter school. So, uh, just want to give you a little primer on on who <laughs> Rahm Emanuel is. Well, he was up on ABC last night talking about what's happening right now in the Democratic Party. Uh, Dorsey, can you roll that clip real quick so we can comment on it? Here we go. Those Biden Republicans aren't going to exist at the end of this election. Can I say one thing? The Green New Deal, Medicare for all, not even in the platform, showing Biden has actually control of the party's direction. Chris Christie, four years ago, Meg Whitman, Christy Todd Whitman both endorsed Hillary Clinton. So how big a threat are these Republican endorsements tonight? Zero. Zero. I mean, they're... He, he said the quiet thing out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, okay, so, so you, were, you were on the Rules Committee and you proposed a... A rule change that I think would have a, an extraordinary uh, shift in how the DNC functions, who's in the DNC, who's calling the shots, who gets chosen to be the chair, who gets the nominations, et cetera, et cetera. So can you talk about this rule uh, that you put forward? Yeah, you know, and it's a, it's an anti-corruption amendment that I was proposing. And in addition to all those things you said, I think the biggest proponent, the biggest upsides of it is that it would actually help us win elections by restoring faith uh, in our party among the over 100 million voting age people that do not vote. Um, and then it would also allow us, once we got in, to actually pass progressive policy. So it seems like those are kind of the two most important things, right? Um, and uh, what the amendment did was said two things. One that we should continue permanently to not accept corporate PAC money to the DNC um, by putting that into the charter. And two, that we shouldn't have DN that we shouldn't have corporate lobbyists literally sitting on the DNC in the actual committee spots. It didn't even, you know, it didn't ban them from the building. It didn't even ban them from, you know, the halls of Congress, anything like that. Um, certainly, I'm sure they would have still had an enormous amount of influence. But it said, hey, let's just not have them literally be the people that are on these committees, taking these votes, creating our platform and um, being the people that, you know, are supposed to say what the Democratic Party stands for. Well, but that's that's sort of the design, right? You know, you have the elected DNC members I'm talking about the DNC uh, separate from the convention, you have the elected DNC members who, depending on what state they're in, um, you know, in New York, they're, they're elected, but they're really chosen by Cuomo. Uh, but in other states, you California, you, you, you run across the state, you raise money, you buy swag, you go to committee meetings, uh, and then they get elected and they're real people. Some might be industry insiders, but for the most part, they're real people. But these committee spots that you're talking about, whether it's the rules committee, which determines how the DNC functions, what the platform is, how who gets the nomination, how whether or not caucuses exist or can be reformed, who gets the contracts, all of this stuff happens by these committees. And I just don't understand why they wouldn't want to have uh, the weapons manufacturer lobbyists on the platform committee making sure that Palestine is not rac recognized or that we uh, invest in the military and industrial complex. Who wouldn't want to be on that committee if you were working with those people? Exactly. And I mean, you know, but I think the answer is, and it's all it's all part of this whole big thing. Why was why was the convention last night so devoid of any substance or telling people how it's going to help them? It's because 
they, the, the establishment, and you know, and I, I was one of the first staffers on Barack Obama's campaign, on John Kerry's campaign, when they both ran for president all the way back in the Iowa caucus. I've, I've actually, I actually worked for the DNC at one point back in the day. And what I saw, you know, love I, you. oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I worked <laughs> for a congressman too. But what I saw was that there's, there's one mentality and that is that um, the way to win is literally solely focused on how much money can you raise and then to run these ads that are just so, so watered down, such platitudes, so devoid of anything interesting that their polls tell them that it's super popular because they're just saying something, they're basically not saying anything so nobody can oppose it, right? Um, and then they, they convince themselves that that's the only way to win. Well, the huge downside of that, yes, does that work sometimes and a lot of times to win? Sure it does. But the big downside of that is then you're beholden to all of these corporate interests and billionaires that are loading your pockets full of, of campaign cash. And there's a, there's, there's a better way and progressives understand it. And the thing that the establishment does not understand that they may not ever understand, which is why they need to be replaced, is that progressives are trying to help them win, are trying to help progressive candidates win. They, they think that progressives are just the people in the back of the room throwing spitballs and, and criticizing and making it less likely for them to win. But that's literally the opposite. I mean, I just kept thinking last night when I was watching this convention coverage, could you imagine if they took this amazing opportunity where they had two hours to speak to the American people, if they said, we're going to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. So the millions of you that are watching this that make less than that, we're literally giving you a raise. And for the rest of you, this is why the raising the, the minimum wage of $15 actually raises every single American's literal paycheck the moment that we do it. And we are going to give you free health care. All the millions, tens of millions of you that are watching this, that have bills that are too high, that can't pay health care, that don't know what you're going to do, that are super worried and anxious, we are going to give it to you. Could you imagine how many more votes that they would get, not just from progressives, but from those hundreds of million, you know, over 100 million people that don't vote right now? So how did the, the how did these DNC folks uh, on this committee respond to your putting this forward? Because you know one thing that we like to do on the show uh, when we have the opportunity and there's no better opportunity than the DNC is is kind of go through some of the the tricks the tricks of the trade what happens the dirty tricks behind the scenes. Um, these committees are full of dirty tricks and 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 if I could just add one point, oftentimes they don't let the same progressives join the committees because they learn the tricks. So they bring in a new group of progressives. They say, oh, yeah, you can have your progressive spots. But then it's like new people who've never seen the tricks before. So, but you, you've, you've been around. You were on the platform committee with me, I remember, in 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, how, do they, uh, how do they respond to your, your amendment? Well, you know, my guess is that they, um, they actually, before, before Bernie came along, they probably basically never let progressives on the committees. But um, the way they responded was not just, you know, voting it down like they did all the other progressive amendments. What they did was they literally rigged the voting device and then used underhanded tactics in addition to that to try to kill the amendment without even having a vote okay, on okay. it. Let's, let's break this yeah. down. <laughs> Let's 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 pace it out time. I think, folks, this is this is not like conspiracy theory. I saw <laughs> this happen before. Um, first, first up, you have a committee of how many people? Uh, what was it about? A, probably less. about one hundred and seventy-five people or so. A What's less the makeup, more or less, percentage-wise? It was. I think it was about two thirds um, DNC and Biden, you know, appointed folks, and then there and then a, a small loyal contingent of progressives that were uh, yeah. nominated by Bernie. But sometimes, sometimes with the DNC folks in particular, you'll get a little spillover. You'll, yeah, I remember the platform committee. We 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 brought in some Hillary people who said, "I'm not for cutting Social Security. I'm voting with Bernie's people." So, oh, so that one third can sometimes grow. Um, okay, so you, so you present this this amendment. Everyone gives their speeches for and against. Who spoke against? Well, okay, so, well, you know, you'll remember um, back in, 20, you know, and since this is my first time on your show, I should, you know, mention that 
Um, back in 2016, when, when we were both on the platform committee, I put forth a similar uh, amendment, only it was to put in the platform that as a party, we stand for getting big money out of politics, that literally the first person to speak was you. You jumped up. I didn't know you at the time. You gave an amazing, I assume, off the cuff, impassioned speech in support of the amendment, which was incredible. And, and um uh, which is the moment I became a fan of yours. But then, of course, the, the very first person that the establishment put up was literally a corporate lobbyist who stood up there and was trying to convince everyone why they should vote against my amendment. This was in 2016. I thought that was hilarious, a, a funny joke. I thought it was like ridiculous, like a ridiculous mistake, frankly. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't think too much about it until four years later this year when I did a similar amendment only on the rules committee and they literally picked from the very committee that was voting a corporate lobbyist as the first person to speak against the amendment. I'm just curious, who was it? You know, I don't names. even, I don't even oh, know. Okay. We'll I, you know, I, I'm not, it's I, yeah. Though. In the future, we got to name these names because they don't like it. They don't do. like being exposed. They think they can operate in the shadows and they'll get away with it. And, and for the most part, they do. Well, so, you know, and I will say um, I, at, on my Twitter account on pinned, it's at Brent Welder, so Brent with an N and Welder like the it's job. There, yeah. um, it, the list is on there, yeah, of everybody that voted against it. Oh, okay, that's good. Good to know. So, all right, so you had this vote happen. Um, there's, there's speakers for and against. They call the vote. How are you supposed to actually vote? What is the system of voting? So, so to see the, the meeting, there was, I guess, kind of like a Zoom window, and then there was a separate window on our computers, which was just literally had a couple of buttons, yes, no, or abstain. So as soon as I was done giving my speech as to why I was proposing this amendment, I mean, they, they said, the chairwoman said, um, it's time to open up the voting. So I went over to the voting device, whatever you want to call it, the voting screen, and to, to obviously vote yes for my own amendment, and it didn't work. The, the, the voting, it was turned off. You could not vote. You would try to click on it. It didn't work. It was grayed out. And that hadn't happened on any of the previous six amendments or any of the other votes that we had been taken, uh, taking over the two hours before that. So, th so I'm listening to this corporate lobbyist, you know, drone on about why they should vote against my common sense anti-corruption amendment. And I'm occasionally going back to this other voting device to try to vote yes on my own amendment. Still not working. Still not working. Then all of a sudden it became crystal clear why um, they apparently had their techies on the back end not turn the voting on when the chairwoman had opened the, the, the vote. And that's because there was this, you know, out of thin air motion to table my amendment, which clearly was premeditated because then all of a sudden another person pops up and is able to second that amendment, even though throughout the entire meeting, every committee person was shoved in a different Zoom room with our, with our microphones off. And all of a sudden, the voting starts working again, only it's to vote on whether or not to table my amendment. No discussion, not what that even meant. Luckily, they had accidentally left my microphone on and kept me in that, in that room, so I was able to protest and, and <laughs> ask, what on earth does this even mean um, to table the amendment? Table until when, right? The meeting was going to be over that's, in that's 10 minutes. I said, is it tabling it like, I literally thought like maybe t until the next convention four years from now. And, um, and Barney Frank, and everybody can go on and f see the exact, you know, what everybody said. But Barney Frank essentially said, well, actually, it just tables it until the end of this meeting. And then if, if it doesn't get untabled, then it dies with this committee. And I said, oh, well, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> I said, um, why don't we just go ahead and take an up and down vote on it? Well, at that point, you know, I think the fix was already in and uh, the committee voted to table it. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's this pattern. Um, anytime there's something related to finances in the DNC, they conveniently find a way to table it, whether it's to the end of the meeting or... Uh, to the next meeting in which there's going to be a whole new set of members or to the other meeting. When we had the Unity Reform Commission, there was a piece uh, that Dr. Zogby and I worked on we were on the party, party reform committee in which we went through the finances and we're like, oh, gosh, the budget. No one's ever seen the budget. Uh, last night we had Ray Buckley on, who's the first to ever discuss this as an executive committee member who's like one of a handful of folks that actually have, you know, real decision making, supposed to have real decision making in the party. And he goes, I've never seen a budget. Can you imagine being on a board of anything and not seeing a budget before <laughs> yeah. or after? 
anything. It's like a pie chart. That's what they present. They're like, oh, we spent 75% of our money on this. Prove it. Um, so the staff has control over the budget, and we wanted to create some sort of accountability mechanism, an oversight board, something, something. And they just kept tabling it and tabling it, and then it just disappeared into thin air. We don't know where it went. No idea. Uh, but we wasted two years of our lives running mm. around the country trying to do this. And you did too. It's, you know, it's your own dime. You're going out there. You're fighting the cause. Um so I'm curious, who, so you had Barney Frank and uh, who was the other chair? <laughs> yeah. You're doing the, yeah, you know, I, I have to admit, I, can, I'll, I am I'll not, I'll I'm it. not like a, Major like, lobbyist. But <laughs> I'm not the in these, chair. I'm not usually invited to the, uh, you know, DNC cocktail party. Okay. So. It was, it was um, <laughs> not a cocktail party, but Maria Cardona, who I used to go up against on CNN all the time, she is, okay. uh, she, she was a super delegate. Uh, she is a, a, um, a lobbyist and um yeah. i know she's a lobbyist for i think dewey square dewey group square. which does a ton she of does. yeah yeah you go look up dewey square's clients i think Li <laughs> fang from the intercept and uh Zedjelani have done a lot of work around that well and i know you um you had the reporter on for sludge the other day yes, who did definitely. some reporting on this and he identified um 25 percent of just the members of this actual committee i was sitting on 25 percent of the people that voted against the the anti-corruption amendment were actual corporate lobbyists, corporate lawyers, corporate board members, corporate advocates, um, 25% of them. And that's just on this particular. Yeah, 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 exactly. They're for weapons manufacturing, but as long as the CEOs are people of color. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. That's what it is. Well, and, and, you know, and I think it's important too, and maybe people realize this, but the reason to explain, the reason they want to um, table it instead of just voting it down is because they want to both kill it, but also not even have a record with their name. It's so extremely unpopular, um, them voting against this, this clean government um, uh, proposal, that they don't even want it out there with their name attached, not to mention that actually there was a lot of elected officials themselves who I could see it being used against them in their campaigns, right? But they don't even want it out there for people to know that they were so sleazy and so corrupt that they voted against this kind of proposal. But now we have it, you know, out there. We have the list because ultimately um, some people on the Bernie campaign were able to reach out to the Biden campaign um, kind of offline. And at the very end, when they were just getting ready to um, to, to complete the meeting, to adjourn, all of a sudden they said, oh, well, we've decided that we're going to have a vote to take it off the table. The Biden people instructed their members to, I guess, vote to take it off the table. And then they did have the up and down vote, although you'll be surprised to learn um, they still voted two to one against uh, the anti-corruption amendment. I'm not surprised by this at all. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it's definitely going to be uh, the electeds that are scared of this. They don't want to be on the record. And... Um, you know, this is this is the DNC that we're working with. Brent, fascinating. Uh, tonight's going to be an interesting night. We mm -hmm. we. I'm looking forward to at least sixty seconds of it. So I was going to say sixty seconds. I'm actually <laughs> looking forward to seeing Bill Clinton. I'm, I'm curious to see how oh, oh. how AOC is the opening us. act for Bill Clinton. Well, you know, he, he always <laughs> is that delivers right? something. He delivers yeah. something. Not yeah. always the yeah. right thing, but it's uh, entertaining. Brent. Really grateful for you joining the show. Thanks for being patient with with the Zoom glitches, and um, we hope to have you back on when we when we pick up our normal programming. All right. Well, thank you. I love the show, and uh, keep uh, doing what you do. Talk thank to you so later. much, Brent. Yeah. Bye. And to all of you guys who've been sticking around, thank you uh, for for joining the show. Uh, thank you for being patient. Tomorrow we are going to be back up at 3 p.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Uh, if you watch the Majority Report, right after Majority Report, scoot on over to the Nomi Key Show. Click subscribe and it'll just alert you when we're on. Um, click share, like, and if you're not on our uh, one of our patrons already, join us at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. We're going to put extra content out there this week, uh, extended interviews. And then next week, programming note, uh, we are doing the RNC it's going to be done a little bit differently. We will cover the RNC's events, but but we want to highlight how the Republicans are basically trying to uh, use the, the the mechanisms of the power to prevent progressives from winning, from for Democrats from winning, of course, and what obstacles we face in this election, but also um, you know areas are trying to privatize, etc. Uh, and Definitely tune in because we're going to have some good guests this week. I think I mentioned yesterday that Noam Chomsky is going to join, join us one of these days this week. It will be a surprise. Uh, but we also have Dr. Jim Zogby, Francesca Fiorentini. Uh, we have our guests from today. They're going to join us again, Larry Cohen and Jane Kleb. Larry Cohen's the, the chair of Our Revolution. And many 
more. Uh, join us on the nomikishow.com for swag as well. And I want to thank you all for sticking around. Thank you to Kyle for, and Dorsey and Ruthie on our end uh, and George. You know, you guys have helped make this show happen. And Kelly, of course, who's who's always watching live and making sure that YouTube is is working properly as well. All right. Thank you all. See you tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Uh, check out the DNC tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, the 60 seconds of AOC's speech and and what could mechanically go wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. Hopefully she'll she'll be able to get everything out in those 60 seconds. All right. Take care. Stay safe. Stay well. See you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern.